Okay, uh, we'll get started and continue our discussions on dynamic programming today. <coughs> So in the previous lecture, we saw that there are situations where your dynamic programming has constraints, not your dynamic program, but your actions have constraints. And in particular, in uh, some examples or some applications, the actual problem would be like this. Uh, you have your usual state transition function, xt is the state, ut is the action, ft is the state transition function. And you want to minimize c capital T plus 1, xt plus 1, plus summation ct, xt, ut, t goes from 1 to capital T. And you want to minimize over all policies gamma t that maps xt to ut. Okay, so we want to minimize over all policies, but now we have a constraint, and the constraint could be gt of xt ut less than equal to zero, ht of xt ut is equal to zero. And this sort of constraints are there for all t. And this is known as state dependent action constraint. State dependent hyphen. So if you recall from the previous class in the resource allocation problem, we had zero less than ut less than xt, which you can write it as ut, ut minus xt less than equal to zero. No, minus ut. So this is my g of xt comma ut. Okay, so as you can see in the resource allocation problem, I can actually write a function g, and at every point of time, I'm supposed to meet that requirement that g is less than, gt is less than equal to zero. And of course, for the sake of generality, I'm going to assume that you have an ht, which also needs to be equal to zero. Okay, so you could have equality constraint, you could have inequality constraints, and all those constraints have to be met at every point of time. Now, when you are riding a vehicle, your acceleration profile must satisfy the constraint so that you don't bump into other cars uh, 
You could have state constraints as well. You could have constraints on the state itself, like your velocity must be less than or equal to um, 70 miles per hour, for instance, if you're on a highway. Or in some cases, on some highways, you have a minimum velocity and a maximum velocity. So the minimum would be 55 miles an hour, and maximum would be 75 miles an hour, or 70 miles an hour. So if you have state constraint, xt plus 1, less than or equal to 75 and greater than or equal to 55 miles an hour and uh, less than or equal to 75 miles an hour, you can equivalently write it as 55 less than or equal to ft of xt ut less than or equal to 75. Okay, so sometimes you may have state constraints. Your state actually has a constraint, like you, you cannot the temperature in this room cannot go above 80 degrees Fahrenheit and it cannot go below 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Although I would tell you that my office in Dries lab, it's always at 60 degrees Fahrenheit for some reason I don't understand. Okay, so in my office, <laughs> there are no state constraints. But ideally, we would like to have state constraints everywhere as far as comfortable temperature for the human beings goes. So human beings are comfortable from 69 degrees Fahrenheit to about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the usual temperature at which offices are kept. If you look at warehouses, warehouses have the constraint that you can go all the way to 80 or 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and in the case of pharmaceutical industry, if you are storing, I don't know, vaccines and, and drugs and all that stuff, then they also have precision temperature control. They have to be, have, they have to be, the temperature has to be controlled within certain bounds in those situations as well. So a lot of situations, you have direct state constraint. You don't, const you control the air conditioning system in order to meet the state constraint. You control the acceleration and braking of the vehicle in order to meet the state constraint. But as you can see at point at time t, your constraint has to depend on the current state and the current action, not on the future state. So well, how do you formulate it? Well, you, you replace that with the future state constraint, and then you replace that future state with the state transition function. And you get a constraint which looks something like this. Okay, does this make sense? So you could have state constraint, you could have resource constraint, and more generally you could have state dependent action constraints, okay? Now the question is, I have a dynamic problem, I have a dynamic optimization problem with all these constraints, how do I solve it? And while you can also solve it using the Pontryagin maximum principle method, uh, just like I had mentioned, you can write it as a constraint optimization problem and you put this also in the constraint and then you can use the Lagrange multiplier theorem to, to derive a necessary condition for optimal solution and you can use method of multipliers or you can use any of the other methods for solving that constraint optimization problem. So I'm not worried about computing the optimal open loop solution because you are very well versed with all the ways of solving constraint optimization problem. So therefore, you can solve it. I, I'm not too worried about that. The question is, what happens if you want to solve for optimal strategies, not optimal action? Okay, optimal action is easy. Optimal strategies is more difficult. So what I want to talk about today is a dynamic programming approach for solving that class of problems. Any questions so far? Can someone tell me how should I go about solving this problem? So you, we know how to solve a usual unconstrained optimization problem using dynamic programming. Can someone try to attempt, or, or no, not try to attempt, just attempt at coming up with an algorithm, a dynamic programming algorithm for solving this problem? I'm 100% sure whatever you come up with is going to be the actual theory 
but I still want you to try and see if you can derive it from first principles. So remember the first thing we have to do is define the terminal value function. What should that be? CT plus one, that's the terminal cost. Okay, so the terminal value function part, the easier part I have done, now comes the more difficult part. What should I do at time capital T? Okay, so I have Vt, x capital T equals to minimum over what? So let's consider that minimum of what? Well, it has to be the current cost and the future value, right? So it's minimum of Ct, xt comma ut plus future value, Vt plus one, xt ut okay this is what we did in the previous class uh, for the two examples and what are we minimizing over well we are minimizing over u of t but in the in the in the earlier lectures ut was unconstrained so i could write ut in rm and i could get done with it but now my ut has constraints so what should i do ut has constraints what should i do now yes add the constraints add the constraints so which constraints can i add at this point of time remember i have like a whole bunch of constraints for all time t uh, the ones at capital t the ones at capital t perfect So I add these two constraints in the minimization problem. Now if you fix xt, if I fix xt, this is a regular constraint optimization problem over ut. Okay, so minimize over ut in Rm such that these constraints are met. And if you recall, this is exactly what we did in the previous class with the resource allocation problem. At every point of time, we, uh, we added these constraints. And then we saw that, okay, the constraints will never be, uh, will be active, so I can remove the constraints and just solve the problem without considering the constraints. So this is the way to compute Vt and then my gamma star of capital T of X capital T would be the argument of the same problem. Okay, I can continue this step at every point of time and I can solve for the optimal solution, store it in Vt, sorry, optimal solution will be stored in gamma star T, optimal value will be stored in Vt, and I can keep going uh, one step back and redo the whole computation. Now again, the problem is, the, the biggest problem with this sort of approach is the fact that now that you have inequality constraints, and you have some cost function, you can't really solve it in closed form. What I mean by closed form is you can't really write. So in, again, in the previous class, we had a resource allocation problem and the LQR problem, and in both those cases, we could write the value function and the optimal policy, 
Exactly, because we could come up with a closed form expression in those situations. So optimal policy was linear, and the optimal value function was quadratic in the case of LQR, and it was uh, logarithmic in the case of resource allocation problem. Now in these, in more general situations, you can't really solve this problem at all because uh, you cannot solve this problem in closed form. You can't write an expression that, okay, gamma star is going to look something like this and Vt is going to look something like that. It's difficult. So you have to use numerical methods at every point of time to solve it. So let's think about the numerical method part a little bit. So consider a simple situation where my xt uh, lies in the set. So let's consider this room example. So the temperature of the room varies between 69 to 75. Let me check what the temperature right now. It's, uh, it's above 69, okay. So I have 69 to 75. So my xt lies in like a set uh, which has which is an interval 69 to 75 and I want to optimize the cost of cooling or heating this particular room subject to certain constraints. So the constraints is of course there is a state constraint that you want the temperature to lie within this interval at all time. But you could also have constraints such as uh, depending on the occupancy of the room this much amount of air must be circulated at the very least. At the very least, this much volume of air must be circulated at every point of time. <coughs> so we could have constraint. We could have airflow constraint. We could have temperature constraints. Um, and we could have occupancy constraints based on occupancy of the room. Okay, so we have a bunch of constraints here. And now I want to solve this dynamic program. I want to find what the optimal policy for cooling or heating this room is going to be based on the current temperature of the room. Can someone tell me how to implement this dynamic programming algorithm? What should we do? Uh, so if you think about it, this value function has to be evaluated at every state. I have infinitely many states between 69 to 75. Right? It's an interval. An interval contains infinitely many values. So what should we do? How should we compute the value function? Yes? Approximate it. Uh, how do you want to approximate the value function? You don't know? Okay. That is the right answer, but there are multiple ways by which we can approximate. Just wanted to know if uh, you have any thoughts on how you would want to approximate the value function or even the way you are conducting this optimization. Yes? Maybe on um, first order Taylor expansion. First order Taylor expansion. No, I think that part will come a little later. Let's try to uh, do something which is far more simpler. So here is what I'm going to do. I have to, I'm, I'm required to, as part of the dynamic programming algorithm, I'm required to compute this at every state and I'm required to compute this policy at every state. But here is what I'm going to do. I, instead of assuming that my state is in an interval, I'm just going to approximate this interval with this set. Okay, so I have like six points, no, six, no, seven points. I have seven points in the state space now. So my original state space is continuous, but I'm going to look at these seven points in the state space, and I'm going to solve this optimization problem exactly at these seven points. And this is known as discretizing the state space. So I'm going to discretize the state space and I'm going to compute the value function at each of these discrete points. 
So wherever you see xt, I'm going to replace this xt with 69, 69, 69, 69. Now it becomes an optimization problem over ut, and I can solve it. I can solve it using um, the method of multipliers, or I could solve it using sequential quadratic program. Remember I told you that sequential quadratic program is something that you will use very often. So this is where you would use sequential quadratic program. So I'll fix state at 69. I view this problem purely as a function of ut. So I'll solve it as a function of ut using sequential quadratic program. And I'll store the optimal value as vt of 69 and gamma star t of 69. Then I'll do the same thing for xt equals to 70. I'll replace it with 70, 70, 70, 70. And then I'll uh, solve the optimization problem using sequential quadratic program or method of multipliers. And I'll rename it as vt of 70 and gamma star t of 70. So now what I have done is I have computed the value function and the policy at these seven points. So instead of computing at infinitely many points, I'm computing at finite number of points, especially, uh, uh, specifically I'm computing it at seven points. So now I have the following thing. Here is what I have. I have V T of 69, V T of 75, and then I have gamma star t of 69, 75. OK, so this is what I, I have. OK, so I can store it in the memory. I can store the value function, and I can store the gamma star t in the memory at the terminal time step. OK, now I have to go back one step. I have to start doing. Uh, optimization at time t minus 1. So let me write down the optimization at time t minus 1. So v t minus 1. Okay. Perfect. So now I'm going to use the same approach. I'm going to put xt minus 1 as 69. 69, 69, 69, 69. So I have a solution, uh, sorry, I have an optimization problem. But here is an issue that arose. So for a specific ut minus 1 that I want to pick, turns out that ft minus 1 of 69 comma the ut minus 1 I wanted to pick, turns out to be this value, turns out to be 69.76. Now I have a problem. I know what VT of 69 is. I know what VT of 70 is. But I don't know what VT of 69.76 is. What should I do? Uh, 
I want to solve this problem and I, I set my xt minus 1 equals to 69 to follow the same thing that I was trying to do here. But I got into an issue because for a specific ut minus 1, which was say my initial guess for the optimal solution, this value turns out to be 69.76. What can I do? Yes. Round or uh, maybe take the floor or the ceiling. I'm not sure which one. Yeah. Uh, so you want to round off this particular value, okay? No, uh, that's not the right. Th that may be one solution, but I'll 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 tell you what is a better solution than that. So here is. Let's look at the axis. This is 69, this is 70, 71, 72. I know the value function at these points. These are my value functions. This is my xt, and this is my, sorry, x capital T, v capital T of x capital T. And 69.76 will be somewhere here. I can do a linear interpolation, something that you have all studied in signals and systems. I can do linear interpolation and I can extend the values that I've computed to the entire space. So I have a bunch of points. I know the values at those bunch of points. I want to create a signal which is continuous. I don't want to say signal, but the ideas are pretty similar. Just like you use some sort of filtering scheme to get a discrete signal, you convert it into an analog signal like digital to analog converter. You might have studied it in your signals and systems class. So we are just borrowing that concept. So we have the values at discrete points and I want to come up with a continuous function which I can use linear interpolation or I could use spline interpolation to get the function values in the intermediate point. So I'll use linear interpolation. Any problem you see with linear interpolation? Anything that could get us into trouble? So remember, no matter what kind of algorithm we are using, we have to compute derivatives. When we have to compute the derivative of the value function, if you extend the value function using linear interpolation, then the value functions may be non-differentiable at these points. So typically, when you're using linear interpolation, well, you don't want to use linear interpolation, you want to use some interpolation technique which is differentiable. So spline interpolation or quadratic interpolation would be better than linear interpolation. So the upshot, use linear interpolation or spline interpolation. Okay, so spline would give you differentiable interpolation. So VT would at least be first differentiable uh, or you could use second order spline. So in which case VT would be second order differentiable but not third order differentiable. So you can use spline interpolation, which will be more computationally complex, or you could use linear interpolation, but then somehow you will have to take care of all the non-differentiability issues that may arise. Remember that this function vt is non-differentiable only at certain discrete points. Maybe during your optimization solution, you don't hit those points, and therefore you don't have to worry about the non-differentiability issue 
but you could, uh, in, in principle, you could get into trouble. In practice, you almost never get into trouble because it's not like you know, your value is going to be 71. It would either be 71.001 or it could be 69.998, right? So at those two points, you are differentiable, even with linear interpolation. So you should be fine. I generally use linear interpolation because it's much faster to do it linear interpolation. If I use spline interpolation, my MATLAB will hang, my system will crash, you know, all kinds of bad things will happen uh, because it's more time consuming and, and more uh, complicated to do higher order interpolation. Okay, so hopefully this gives you an idea of how you can execute this dynamic program in a computer, which is you come up with a discrete set of points in the state space, you evaluate the value function at those discrete set of points, you evaluate the policies at those discrete state of points, set of points, and then you use linear interpolation or spline interpolation for both the value function as well as for the policy. So you can use it for value function and you can use this interpolation technique for policies as well. And this brings me to the topic that one of your friends alluded to earlier, you do approximations, okay? This is an approximation. You're not computing the true value function, but you're actually approximating the value function using linear interpolation technique and the corresponding optimization solution. The other thing to note here is remember, every time you try to compute the solution numerically, you get to the stationary point. You don't get to the optimal solution. So you lose that certificate of optimality. So as long as you are computing the minimum, you are fine. This, 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 this whole process will give you a very good optimal, approximately optimal solution. But as soon as this problem becomes non-convex, and you're using, say, method of multipliers or sequential quadratic program to solve this problem, uh, you can at best get to a first order stationary solution, which means you're not computing the minimum, which means this is not the true value function. Whatever you are computing is not the true value function and the truly optimal solution. Uh, but you can continue this process, and whatever you get would probably be an approximate optimal solution. Maybe it will be a bad approximation, but it's better than doing nothing, right? So if you think about it, a lot of the vehicles nowadays are using techniques such as these to minimize emissions, okay? And even if you get 1% emission reduction by using sequential quadratic programming and by using some, some approximate dynamic programming techniques that we will be talking about in the class, even if you get 1% reduction, Multiply it to all the vehicles that are running around in the world, and you get a huge reduction in the carbon emission and a huge reduction in the energy consumed by the transportation sector. So if you go to auto companies, they literally care about 1% reduction in fuel, uh, in, in fuel consumption or 1% or enhancement in fuel economy. It makes them look good in front of their consumers, which is actually us. So. So these techniques are pretty powerful in trying to squeeze every ounce out of the fuel that are being used in the vehicle. Okay. So now you know how to run dynamic program over uh, continuous state spaces. Uh, this technique of using linear interpolation or spline interpolation is very easy to implement if your state was one or two dimensional. So one dimensional state could be like velocity or temperature of this room. And two dimensional state could be, in the case of a vehicle, it could be the state of charge of the battery and the velocity of the vehicle. Okay, so you could have two dimensions in the state space if, if you have a hybrid vehicle. Or in the case of this building, you could have one thermostat here, one thermostat in some other room, and so it becomes a two-dimensional state space problem, and you can run dynamic programming and you can, you can solve 
for the optimal solution. One thing that I will tell you is if you start implementing dynamic programming for real systems, some of these constraints may be aspirational in nature. So for instance, I have, a, I have an Ecobee thermostat at my house and I have a remote temperature sensor that senses the temperature of our bedroom. And it so turns out, due to the way our house is constructed, our bedroom is always five degrees Fahrenheit higher than the thermostat temperature itself because our thermostat is in the living room which has a lot of cold air coming in from here and there and our bedroom is pretty well insulated so therefore the temperature there is five degrees higher all the time and even if I want to reduce the temperature of my bedroom if I want to reduce the temperature of my bedroom I have to end up reducing the temperature of my living room and vice versa. If I want the living room to be, to be warm, then my bedroom will be actually very, very warm. And I just have to live with it. So many a times these constraints will never be met in my house. Even though I want to meet those constraints, I want to have the same temperature in my living room and my bedroom. Because of the way construction is done, it's just infeasible to have that. So that's also something you want to keep in mind when you are actually implementing some of these algorithms in real systems because you may want to put whatever constraints you want to put but reality may be quite different. There may be physical constraints that will not let you implement those, uh, that will not let you uh, satisfy those constraints. What will happen in those situations? What do you think will happen in those situations when you are solving this optimization problem? When you are running sequential quadratic program or when you are running uh, method of multipliers, the Lagrange multipliers will go to infinity because you are never able to meet the constraints. Okay? Which is why I had mentioned when you are running sequential quadratic program or when you are running uh, method of multipliers, you should always keep track of Lagrange multipliers and as soon as you see Lagrange multipliers escaping to infinity or minus infinity, you know that you have a problem in the constraint set and your constraints are infeasible. So when you start going from the theory that is being discussed in the class to a practical implementation, you have to keep track of a lot of these issues that arise in real world systems. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Now another point I want to note here is so far I have talked about systems where the state space and the action spaces were continuous which means that they took values in Rn or Rm. Now there are a lot of systems where the state space and action space need not be continuous. So in some cases your action space could be 0, 1, binary variable and in some cases your state space could be discrete. So for instance, if you look at uh, Starbucks, XT would be the number of customers who are, who are standing in the queue and UT would be how many cash registers they need to open up, right? And many a times when I'm in, in Kroger for instance and the customer representative sees that there is a huge line for like two or three checkout lanes that are open. They will open another lane, checkout lane, in order to ease the traffic congestion in the checkout counter at Kroger or at Giant Eagle or at any of the grocery stores. That's the case where XT would be the queue length of customers standing in line and UT would be how many cash registers should be open or closed. Right? And they have a complex cost function in mind. So you could have a person who is uh, putting groceries on the stack, on, on, the, on the floor, and the same person could also come to the cash register and check out customers. So they have to figure out what's the right balance in terms of uh, allocating human resources within the store. So, so those are situations where XT is actually discrete and UT is also discrete. Okay, and you have the same optimization formulation and arguably you can 
essentially use the same technique for solving the optimization problem, except that now that ut is discrete, so let me, for the sake of argument, just write ut is in 0, 1 raised to n. You can still solve this problem either through exhaustive search or by invoking duality, something that we have talked about earlier in the class. So there are well-known solvers for solving optimization problems of this type where ut takes discrete number of values. And most of those solvers invoke duality for solving those optimization problems. So you can use one of those optimization algorithms to solve this problem. Store the value of, store the value function, store the policy, and then keep going on and on in terms of solving the dynamic programming problem. Okay, so that's another thing to keep in mind, which is dynamic programming is not just true for states and actions that are continuous, you could also apply dynamic programming to situations where state and actions are discrete. Okay? And in fact, if you look at wireless systems and how the packets are routed in the network, I'm sure there, are, there is one Aruba network switch there. There are actually multiple in the room. And that are, you know, my phone is communicating to that and that particular communication device is figuring out, okay, how should I route the packet over the network? In those situations, this is almost always discrete. This is almost always discrete. And they have very complicated logic to figure out how to route packets in the communication network. So anyways, that's all I have for today. Wanted to touch, give you some insight about how to do constrained dynamic programs how to solve constrained dynamic programs, and the fact that the, the whole framework, theoretical framework, is flexible enough to allow you to essentially use the same algorithm for discrete state and discrete action problems. Okay, in the next class, which is going to be next week, we are just going to talk about approximate dynamic programming. What I did tell you, this method is an approximate dynamic programming technique but it's just one of the techniques. And we will go over a lot of different techniques, approximate dynamic programming techniques for solving com complicated optimization problems of this type. So I'll see you next week. Have a great Thanksgiving break. There, is, there are no classes on Wednesday. So have a great Thanksgiving break, and I'll see you on next Monday.